Bueno, vayamos con y igual a mx más b. Here we'll discuss writing lines using the formula y equals mx plus b. So here's the function y equals mx plus b. x is the function's input, y is the function's output, and m and b are constants, meaning they're numbers that are fixed and they don't change when x changes. Let's look at the function when m is 2 and b is 1. So y equals 2x plus 1. Which of the four lines here represents the function y equals 2x plus 1? ¿Cuál de esas cuatro líneas rectas representa a la función y igual a 2x más 1? A, B, C o B. ¿Alguien dice que la C? Sí. No, la C no es. La B. ¿Cuál? ¿La A? Sí, no, la A. La A. Great. Here are the coordinates for some of the points on this line. Now, what's the slope of this line? Here's the formula for slope. For two points with coordinates x1, y1, and x2, y2, it's y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. ¿Cuál es la pendiente? Necesitaremos tomar un par de puntos. Tomemos estos que son positivos. Siempre es un poco más cómodo, más fácil trabajar con positivos. Entonces sería... <coughs> Esto es uno, y uno, y dos, y dos. Por lo tanto, entonces, esto sería y2 es 3 menos y1 que es 1 entre x2 que es 1 y eh, x1 es 0. Esto sería. Right, the slope is 2, which also happens to be the number in front of the x in the equation for the line. Is that a coincidence? Think about it. But next up, let's talk about y-intercepts. A y-intercept is the value of y where a function hits the y-axis. So what's the y-intercept for this line? What is the intercept y for this point? For this point, this point, what is it? Right. The y-intercept is 1. You can look at the line and see that it's 1. Here's another way to find the y-intercept. Notice that x is positive out here and negative over here. But all along the y-axis, x is equal to 0. So the y-intercept is the y-coordinate of the function when x equals 0. If we plug in 0 for x in the line's equation, 2 times 0 is 0, so this whole term disappears. That leaves us with y equals 1. So the y-intercept is 1, and we found it by setting x equal to 0 in this equation. So in the equation y equals 2x plus 1, 2 is the slope of the line, and 1 is the line's y-intercept. Let's go back to the general equation we wrote for a line at the beginning y equals mx plus b. For any values of m and b, m always represents the slope of the line, and b represents the y-intercept. Now let's talk about the x-intercept. The x-intercept of a line is the x-coordinate of where it crosses the x-axis. For the line y equals mx plus b, what's the x-intercept? Your answer should be an expression in terms of m and b. What is Exactly. So along the x-axis, y equals 0. So the x-intercept is the x-value in the equation for the line when y equals 0. So if we plug in 0 for y and then subtract b from both sides, and then to solve for x, let's divide both sides by m. So the x-intercept equals minus b over m, which is exactly what you got. 
A quick recap. Lines can be written in the form y equals mx plus b. m is the slope of the line, and b is the line's y-intercept, or the y-coordinate where the line crosses the y-axis. Next up, you can make any line you want and convince yourself that m is the slope and b is the y-intercept. Okay, here's your big chance to make your own line. Try dragging this red dot up and down to change the y-intercept of the line. And you can drag up and down elsewhere to change the line's slope. If you want to know the exact y-intercept and slope of your line, you can check the top right corner over here. Okay, so try making a line with a negative y-intercept and a positive slope. Necesitamos eh, que Y tenga valores negativos. ¿Sí? Y tiene valores negativos y la pendiente es positiva. Si la inclino, la pendiente será negativa. Y la pendiente es positiva y siempre que esté aquí, el intercepto será negativo. Vamos al que sí. Funciones cuadráticas. Here we'll prove the quadratic formula. Suppose you have the quadratic function y equals ax squared plus bx plus c. x is the input variable for the quadratic, and a, b, and c are all constant coefficients, shown in green. The question we'll ask here is for which values of x does this quadratic equal zero? So we want to find values of x so that ax squared plus bx plus c equals zero. Our answer will be in terms of a, b, and c. So we're trying to solve this equation, ax squared plus bx plus c equals zero for x. This is tricky because x shows up in two places, both by itself and again as x squared. To solve this equation, Let's first divide everything by a. These two a's cancel out, and over here, 0 over a is still 0. So now we're trying to solve the equation x squared plus b over ax plus c over a equals 0. Which of the following choices is equivalent to the left-hand side of this equation? Siempre sí o siempre no. ¿Cuál es usted? La última. You could try expanding out all the answers to see which one matches, but we're going to try something a little bit different. You'll notice that all of these answers have an x plus something squared and then another constant afterwards. The one exception is this answer, which has a cube. When you expand that to get an x cubed, you know that it can't be right because this expression has no x cubed in it. Okay. Let's assume we have x plus something squared, because all the answers look like x plus something squared, and let's assume that there's a constant after it, because all the answers, again, have a constant after it. If we expand that, we get x squared plus 2d times x plus d squared, and then we have the plus e at the end. If this expression is going to equal this expression, every term has to match. So if you go to the x term, it's 2d here and b over a here. So we know 2d has to equal b divided by a, or d is equal to b over 2a. 
Now, for the constant term, we have d squared plus e up here, and c over a down here. So that means d squared plus e is equal to c over a. We already know what d is, it's b over 2a, so we can plug that in. b over 2a, the whole thing squared, plus e, has to equal c over a. Now, we can expand this square to get b squared over 4a squared plus e equals c over a. And solving for e gives us that e is equal to c over a minus... You could try expanding out all the answers to see which one matches, but we're going to try something a little bit different. You'll notice that all of these answers have an x plus something squared, and then another constant afterwards. The one exception is this answer, which has a cube. When you expand that to get an x cubed, you know that it can't be right, because this expression has no x cubed in it. Okay, let's assume we have x plus something squared, because all the answers look like x plus something squared, and let's assume that there's a constant after it, because all the answers, again, have a constant after it. If we expand that, we get x squared plus 2d times x plus d squared, and then we have the plus e at the end. If this expression is going to equal this expression, every term has to match. So if you go to the x term, it's 2d here and b over a here, so we know 2d has to equal b divided by a, or d is equal to b over 2a. Now, for the constant term, we have d squared plus e up here and c over a down here. So that means d squared plus e is equal to c over a. We already know what d is, it's b over 2a, so we can plug that in. b over 2a, the whole thing squared, plus e, has to equal c over a. Now, we can expand this square to get b squared over 4a squared, plus e equals c over a, and solving for e gives us that e is equal to c over a minus b squared over 4a squared. So our original expression on top was equal You could try expanding out all the answers to see which one matches, but we're going to try something a little bit different. You'll notice that all of these answers have an x plus something squared, and then another constant afterwards. The one exception is this answer, which has a cube. When you expand that to get an x cubed, you know that it can't be right, because this expression has no x cubed in it. Okay, let's assume we have x plus something squared, because all the answers look like x plus something squared, and let's assume that there's a constant after it, because all the answers, again, have a constant after it. If we expand that, we get x squared plus 2d times x plus d squared, and then we have the plus e at the end. If this expression is going to equal this expression, every term has to match. So, if you go to the x term, it's 2d here, and b over a here, so we know 2d has to equal b divided by a, or d is equal to b over 2a. Now, for the constant term, we have d squared plus e up here, and c over a down here. So that means d squared plus e is equal to c over a. We already know what d is, it's b over 2a, 
So we can plug that in. B over 2A, the whole thing squared, plus E, has to equal C over A. Now, we can expand this square to get B squared over 4A squared, plus E equals C over A. And solving for E gives us that E is equal to C over A minus B squared over 4A squared. So our original expression on top was equal to X plus D, or X plus B over 2A squared. And I'm going to switch the order of the terms in E to make it match the answer. So it's minus B squared over 4A squared plus C over A. The only answer that looks like that is the first one. Right. Let's quickly see how you got that. First, you can add and subtract B squared over 4A squared to this equation since that doesn't change the overall value of the left side. This expression here is then equal to the square of x plus b over 2a. This process is called completing the square. By adding and subtracting b squared over 4a squared to the original equation, we formed the square of x plus another number, b over 2a. Now this equation has a single x in it, making it easier to solve. Let's go after that x. First, we can add b squared over 4a squared to both sides and we can then subtract c over a. What's the next step to solving this equation for x? Exactly. We want to take the square root of both sides. But we also need to remember that the square roots can be positive or negative. So we need to include a plus or minus sign here. And now we can solve for x by subtracting b over 2a from both sides. We can get a prettier result if we combine these two expressions on the right-hand side. So we'll need to do a little simplification. The expression under the square root is equal to which of the following? Right. It's equal to this expression. Let's plug this back into the root. The square root of a fraction equals the square root of the numerator over the square root of the denominator. And the square root of 4a squared is 2a. Now both fractions here have the same denominator, 2a, so we can combine them. And we're done. This is the quadratic formula. x equals negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac all over 2a. This is one of the few equations in math that's really worth memorizing, since it comes up so often and it can be a pain to derive it every time you need it. We just found where quadratic functions, which are of the form y equals ax squared plus bx plus c, equals zero. Notice that we have a square root up here. When b squared minus 4ac is positive, the quadratic equals zero in two locations. Which one of these two solutions corresponds to the plus sign in the plus or minus sign from the quadratic formula?
cuadrado de binomio. La de la izquierda, la de la derecha, ambos con ningún número. ¿Ambos? Si A es positivo. ¿Cuál? ¿La de la derecha? Si A es positivo, sea la de la derecha. Si A es negativo, sea la de la izquierda. Right. The one on the right corresponds to the plus sign, since it has the larger x value. The solution on the left corresponds to the minus sign. So to recap, here's a generic quadratic equation. ax squared plus bx plus c equals zero. The solution, given by the quadratic formula, is negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac all over 2a. What's under the square root determines how many roots the quadratic has, meaning how many times it equals zero and crosses the x-axis. When b squared minus 4ac is greater than zero, we said the quadratic has two roots. When b squared minus 4ac equals zero, how many solutions are there? Si b Right. There's just one, since the two solutions have a plus or minus zero up here. Adding and subtracting zero give you the same result, minus b over 2a. Here's what a quadratic looks like when b squared minus 4ac equals zero. See how it touches the x-axis in exactly one place? Finally, when b squared minus 4ac is less than zero, the quadratic has no roots, since negative numbers don't have real square roots. Lo que nos dice es dónde se encuentra la parábola. Si está por debajo, si el valor mínimo está por debajo del cero, si está en el cero o si está por arriba. Sería la ecuación de una parábola. Polinómicas. ¿Qué es eso? The degree of a polynomial. Here's a polynomial. 4x to the 7th plus 3x cubed plus 6x minus 2. x is the input of this function and y is the output. Let's also color all the coefficients green. First off, what are the powers of x for the different terms in this polynomial? ¿Cuáles son las potencias de x para los diferentes términos en, esas, en ese polinomio? 7, 7 y 3, 7, 3 y 1, 7, 3, 1 y 0, 4, 3, 6 y menos 2. ¿Cuál? 7, 3 y 1. The power of x in the 6x term is 1, and the power of x in the 2 term is 0, since any number to the 0th power is 1, and negative 2 times 1 is still negative 2. Now here's the definition for a polynomial's degree. The degree of a polynomial is the highest power that appears in the polynomial. 
So what's the degree of this polynomial? ¿Cuál es el grado de ese polinomio? Right. The highest power is 7. And that's all there is to it. The degree of a polynomial is the highest power in the polynomial. Si hubiera una 5x a la 50, sería un polinomio de orden 50. Teorema fundamental del álgebra. For this tutorial, we'll start off with a few questions. The first question is what's the most zeros a line can have? A zero for a function is where the output is zero. Or in other words, it's where the function crosses the x-axis. So what's the most zeros a line can have? Right, a line can have at most one zero. The next question is what's the most zeros a quadratic function can have? Remember, a quadratic function is one whose highest power is two. So try changing around the coefficients of this quadratic function, a, b, and c. What's the most zeros that a quadratic function can have? Okay, last question. What's the most zeros that a cubic can have? Remember, a cubic is a polynomial whose highest power is 3. So how many times can a cubic function cross the x-axis? Ahí tiene uno. Ahí tiene tres. Ahí tiene dos. Tiene dos. Bueno, casi dos. ¿Cuál es el mayor número que puede tener? In general, a polynomial of degree n can have up to n zeros. What does degree mean? It's the highest power in a polynomial. So in this polynomial here, the degree is 7, the largest power. This statement about polynomials is known as the fundamental theorem of algebra. You found that a line, which is a polynomial of degree 1, has up to 1 zero. A quadratic has up to 2 zeros. And a cubic can have up to 3. Last question. We've sketched a polynomial here. What's a possible value for the degree of this polynomial? ¿Cuál es el grado de ese polinomio? 2, 4, 6, 8. Pero no 6 porque este aquí está. 
significa pongo este o es 7 o es 8, no están nada más estas opciones. Si me han puesto ahí 7, la opción sería 7. Pero como no está el 7, no puede ser ninguno de los menores. Tendría que ser al menos de orden 8 de acuerdo a lo que tiene a las opciones que me están tomando. Entonces, ¿cuál es la Y con esto terminamos las funciones polinómicas. Entonces ya vimos qué son las funciones, qué son las funciones polinómicas, qué son las funciones trigonométricas. Y de hecho vimos que en las funciones trigonométricas están, por ejemplo, este, las sinusoidales, que ahí caben las de seno y las de coseno. ¿A qué tipo de funciones corresponden? También son polinómicas. Entonces, no importaba mucho si veíamos primero una y luego las otras, finalmente vienen siendo casos distintos del mismo fenómeno. Eh, lo que sigue que vamos a ver, eh, bueno, se supone que la sesión termina a las 12, son 11 con 14. Podríamos al menos adelantar un poco para ver las, como se dan cuenta, es un poco más largo en la temática de las funciones de potencias, exponentes y logarítmicas, vamos a adelantar un poco entonces. Funciones de potencia. Here you can make your own power function of the form y equals x to the a. Right now, a is equal to 1, so this function is y equals x, a straight line. Let's change a using this slider bar down here, and let's make it 2. So now we have y equals x squared, which is a quadratic function. Now let's change a and make it negative. Let's make it minus 1. In general, y equals x to the minus a power is the same thing as 1 over x to the positive a power. So this function is x to the minus 1, which is the same thing as 1 over x to the first power, or 1 over x. Now let's make a 0.5. Okay. So this function is y equals x to the 0, 0.5, which is the same thing as the square root of x. For which power is a, does the power function turn out to be concave down? ¿Cuál de estas eh, funciones de potencia son de potencia por tiene la función? Una potencia, el número está elevado a una potencia. Eh, es cóncava abajo. Cuando A es mayor que 1, cuando A es A es la potencia. Cuando A es eh, mayor que 0, cuando es menor que 1, cuando A es mayor que menos 1, menor que 0, o cuando A es menor que menos 1. ¿Cuál? La B. Great. Now let's just look at positive powers, which is when the exponent a is greater than zero. For positive powers, when you put really big values of x into the function, what values of y do you get out? ¿Cuáles son los valores de eh, potencias positivas? Es decir, cuando a es mayor que cero, ¿qué sucede con y? conforme aumenta el valor de x ¿qué sucede? ¿qué le pasa? y es, eh, y se hace muy cercano a cero y se hace negativo infinito o y se hace muy grande se hace muy grande, 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 grande. great now let's set a to be a negative value like this So now what happens to the function as x gets really big? Okay, so let's look at these negative values of a. What happens as x gets really close to zero, but stays positive? 
So we're looking at values of x that are closer and closer to zero on the positive side. What happens to the function? Here we'll discuss the rules for multiplying and dividing powers with the same base. So suppose you have x cubed and x to the fifth. Which of the following choices is the product of these two quantities? ¿Cuál es el producto de las potencias? En este caso, x a la 3 por x a la quinta. x a la octava. Right. Let's quickly see how you got that x cubed is x times x times x, and x to the fifth is five x's all multiplied by each other. Their product is all five plus three, or eight, x's multiplied together, so that's x to the eighth. Next question. In general, what is the product of x to the a and x to the b? ¿Cuál sería la regla para una, un producto de potencias? La última, aquí. La regla de hecho se deduce de la explicación anterior. Right. It's x to the a plus b. Now let's turn our attention to division. What's x to the sixth divided by x squared? Ah, tenemos un cociente. ¿Cuál sería eh, x a la 6 entre x a la 2? Exactly, because x to the 6th is 6x's six multiplied together, and x squared is x times x. The two x's in the denominator cancel out two of the x's in the numerator. That leaves x times x times x times x, or x to the 4th. So in general, what is x to the a divided by x to the b? <coughs> yes, it's x to the a minus b. To summarize, you found that x to the a times x to the b is x to the a plus b, and x to the a divided by x to the b is x to the a minus b. So in general, when you multiply two powers with the same base, x in these examples, you can add their exponents. And when you divide powers with the same base, you can subtract their exponents. Let's talk about exponential functions. Previously, we talked about powers which were functions of the form y equals x to the a, where a is the constant number. Now let's talk about exponentials. To make an exponential function, let's switch the a and the x so that the a is now raised to the x power. And that's an exponential. It's a function in which a constant number is raised to the power of a variable like the x here. Let's also multiply this function by a constant, capital A. And let's also replace the little a with a b. We'll use b here because it represents the base of the exponential function. Great. Next, we'll graph some exponential functions. Okay. Entonces, sí, la diferencia es que eh, teníamos y era igual a x en la de potencia elevado a una potencia. En este caso, en la exponencial es y 
es igual a un coeficiente elevado a la variable x. ¿sí? Es decir, la potencia es la variable. Por eso llamamos exponente, exponencial. Now here's a graph of an exponential function that you can change. You can drag this slider here to change the a, the coefficient in front of the exponential. And you can change b, the base of the exponential, by dragging this slider. So the question here is, let's say that b is greater than 1 and a is positive, it's bigger than 0. As x gets really, really big, what happens to this function? Conforme b para b positiva y a igual a 0, cuando x se hace muy grande, ¿qué pasa con la función? Sí, a mayor que 0. O sea, a es positivo. El coeficiente a es positivo. Aquí está, punto 5 chiquito, pero positivo. ¿Bien? Podríamos aumentar, aumentarle si queremos. Ah, ya pasó de punto 5 a 1. ¿Qué pasa con la con, con y? Cuando x es grande, x aumenta. ¿Qué pasa con el valor de y? Sería entonces y se hace muy grande. Great. Now let's keep this coefficient a as positive, but let's change the base b so that it's less than 1. So here's a value of b that's less than 1. Now what happens as x gets really, really big? ¿Qué pasa con y? O con y, sí. ¿Qué pasa cuando y sea... Cuando, cuando x aumenta, ¿qué pasa con y? Aumentamos x. ¿Qué pasa con el valor de y? ¿Eh? Estamos aumentando el valor de x. X vale 2, y vale esto. X vale 4, y vale esto. Y vale 6. X vale 6, y vale esto. Y se acerca a 0. Ok, last question. Here we want to know for which values of a and b will this exponential function be concave down. Right now it's concave up. It's smiling. There we go. This is a concave up function. But how can you change a and b so that the function is concave down or frowning? O sea, ¿cómo lo hacemos para que la función cambie de ser? Esa tiene así. Eh, si sí, la que tiende a, a cero, pero igual podría más adelante tener esta forma. Se ponga va hacia arriba. Lo que nos está preguntando es que tiene que pasarle a la función para que sea al revés. Ponga va abajo. B debe ser pequeña, B debe ser grande. <coughs> A debe ser positiva o A debe ser negativa. Vamos a ver. B debe ser pequeña. Disminuimos B. Aumentamos B. Parece que B no, B, B no tiene nada que ver aquí. A, si la hacemos positiva, si la hacemos negativa, entonces sería A debe ser negativa. Digamos, eh, una, dos, tres. Reglas para los exponentes. Reglas de las potencias, ahora vamos a ver las reglas de los exponentes. Let's talk about rules for combining exponential functions. Here are two exponential functions: 2 to the x and 3 to the x. What's their product? First, we can rewrite 2 to the x as 2 times 2 times 2 times 2 etc. And 3 to the x as 3 times 3 times 3 times 3, etc. And we've written x2s and x3s here. In this case, we have 5 2s and 5 3s, but in general, you would have x of them. 2 to the x times 3 to the x is the product of all these numbers. Let's combine the 2s and the 3s vertically in pairs. The product of each 2 and 3 is 6. So now we have x sixes all multiplied by each other. 
So what is another way to write 2 to the x times 3 to the x? Right. It's 6 to the x. Next question. Let's replace the 2 and the 3 with variables a and b. Using what you just saw when multiplying 2 to the x and 3 to the x, what is the product of a to the x and b to the x? Right. It's the product a, b, then raised to the x power. Last question. What happens if we replace the multiplication with division? In other words, what is a to the x divided by b to the x? Exactly. So here are the rules for multiplying exponents raised to the same power. a to the x times b to the x equals a b to the x, and a to the x over b to the x equals a over b, then raised to the x. Este, y para no indigestarnos, vamos a quedarnos hasta esta que sería el número e o el número de hoy. Después veríamos logaritmos y con eso terminaríamos esta parte, la próxima sesión. Hoy terminamos con el número de e. El número e. The number e. Here we'll talk about Euler's number, named after the mathematician Leonard Euler. Euler's number is abbreviated as the letter e. E is a very common number in math and science, about as common as the number pi. And so in math or science, if you see a lowercase e, it almost always refers to Euler's number. E is equal to approximately 2.718281828459045 and so on. It's usually good enough to remember that E is approximately 2.71828. E has several important properties. One of them is that it's equal to 1 plus 1 over 1 factorial plus 1 over 2 factorial plus 1 over 3 factorial plus 1 over 4 factorial and so on. As you keep adding the 1 over factorial terms, this sum approaches or converges to E. What's the sum of the terms that we've listed here? The first term is just 1. The second term here is 1 over 1 factorial, which is 1. 2 factorial is just 2, so this is a half. 3 factorial is 6, so this is 1 sixth. 4 factorial is 24, so that's 1 24th. And then for 5 factorial and 6 factorial, we might want to use a calculator. Let's start putting all of this in. So we had 1 plus 1 over 1 factorial, which is 1, plus 1 over 2 factorial, which we said is a half, plus a sixth, plus 1 over 4 factorial, we can write it like that, plus 1 over 5 factorial, plus 1 over 6 factorial. When we evaluate it, we get 2.718. So that large sum is equal to 2.718. Okay. <coughs> 3 por 2 por 1, 3 por 2, 6 por 1, 6. Me quedaría un sexto, ¿correcto? 4 factoriales, 4 por 3 por 2 por 1. 4 por 3, 12. Por 2, 24 por 1, 24. Me queda un vigésimo cuarto. 
5 factorial ¿cuánto es? 5 por 4 5 por 4, 20 por 3 60 por 2, 120 por 1, 120 entonces 5 factorial es 120 me quedaría 1 entre 120 y esta cosa otra vez se volvió a dormir si sí, se aburre muy pronto bien entonces hay que mantenerla activa bien, entonces aquí la sumatoria finalmente de esa serie nos da era 2.718 que son los primeros tres decimales del de número de Euler eh, se escribe Euler pero se pronuncia Euler el alemán el, el, el diptongo EU en alemán se pronuncia OI por ejemplo conocían a un han oído el nombre de este psicólogo Sigmund Freud son los freudianos no se pronuncia EU es OI se pronuncia Freud son freudianos eh, similar vamos no he dicho en el mismo sentido el diptongo EI se pronuncia AI como por ejemplo eh, don Alberto no es Einstein es Einstein ¿sí? o ha leído la novela del monstruo de ¿Sí? no era Frankenstein era Frankenstein ¿Sí? entonces digo nada más para que recuerden E es el número de Euler en español sería E no, tampoco se decía el número O por Euler, no es el número E de Euler ¿correcto? bien, continuemos dice que esta se durmió de acá está cansada, sí, ya, 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 ya queremos irnos. Bueno, este... Nos está planteando una pregunta. ¿Qué pasa si N en esta, relación, en esta secuencia el número de L se hace infinitamente grande? ¿Bien? ¿Qué sucede? Por ejemplo, cuando n se hace, es grande, no, no infinitamente, pero si se hace grande, ¿qué tan grande como 100? ¿Qué sucede con 1 más 1 entre n a la n? ¿Qué quedaría ahí? Ahí está, mira. Se le fue el audio, pero podemos ver qué es lo que está haciendo. Bien. Entonces estamos sustituyendo 100 en la n queda 1.01 a la 100 y eso es un número igual a 2.7048 ¿Sí? es que no me está dando chance de escribir aquí se le trabó vamos a hacer una, un pequeño cambio